Mountains still bow down. Yeah. Mountains still bow down. Tonight we're going to turn to Mark chapter 11 and Zechariah chapter 4. Mark chapter 11. Zechariah chapter 4. Preach part of this last Sunday morning in Kosawa, Ghana. I think I was, I think that's where I was at. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to remember and hard to tell when you're too many places in too short amount of time. Mark chapter 11. <clears throat> Let's read verse 12. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. It says, The next day when they had returned to Bethany, he, this is Jesus, was hungry. Seeing from afar off, a fig tree with leaves. He went to see if perhaps he might find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing except leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of find this passage a little bit interesting. Because we have the one who created it all from the beginning. Yes? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God, right? Says that everything was made by Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. Is that right? So I think He knew about a fig tree. I suspect the Creator of the world knew that it wasn't the time of figs. Yeah? Yet he said he was hungry and he saw it had leaves from afar off and he went to see perhaps if it had any fruit, any figs. And when he got there, there was no figs because it was not the season. Well, he knew it wasn't the season. And Jesus said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Verse 20. In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Now they heard it, and now they saw it. Yeah? Senses. Yeah. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said to him, Rabbi, look. The fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Now, as we read, I don't know about you, but I find Jesus' response kind of strange. And he answered them. Now, think about that. They're addressing the fig tree, right? He's asked a question. He's, he said, look, the fig tree's withered. Matthew's gospel says that it withered instantly. And now it says Jesus answered them. So he's addressing the fig tree, right? Have faith in God. For truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, mountains bow down and the seas will roar. Jesus knows what he's doing. Holy Spirit lines things up. For truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Now think about what he's saying. This is about the fig tree. What? When you look at it, you think, what? Am I the only one? Fig tree and Jesus start talking about mountains. But what, he, what had happened and he had saw a fruitless tree and spoke to it. 
And it happened. Now he says, whoever will speak to their mountain and they believe what they say when they say it, they're going to have it. It says, if he does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Then it's therefore, in light of what I've just said to you, there's a therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. He's talking about mountain moving faith. He is literally talking about that if you, if you, Ask according to the word of God and you believe when you say it that you, that you can speak to the natural elements of this world and they will respond. Do we still believe that? Now before anybody gets carried away, some of you go back far enough to know that Teachers in the past have built entire empires on Matthew chapter 11. This is where the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. <laughs> Affiliations come from right here where we're reading. If you ask anything, if you believe it, don't doubt, you'll have it. But it's actually anything, if you ask anything according to the will of God. So let's stay balanced. He says, there, therefore I say to you, what's the, whatever things you ask when you pray, when you pray, when you pray, after you've prayed, when you've prayed. It's Sunday night, I got time. Whatsoever things you ask when you pray. See, the key to the will of God is to pray. I remember when I first came, when we were having a question and answer session on a Saturday night. Anybody remember that? And one of the questions was about vision and evangelism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is your vision? What do you see? What is your plan? What's the plan, preacher? And most of the time, people don't like my answer when it comes to these things because everybody's got a plan. We talked this morning about some vision. JR didn't have a vision for MAG. God has a vision for MAG, and God prays for, or JR prays for the vision. See, it's a presumption of faith whenever you come up with a plan and then pray for God to bless it. That's not faith, that's presumption. Did you hear me? Oh, this sounds like a good idea. Let's pray about that. No. Let's pray about that and believe God for the idea. Are you hearing me? Do you hear the difference? We don't plan and then pray. We pray for the plan. And when you pray for the plan, then whatever you ask and don't doubt, you can have it. Why? Because the plan was given to you by God. It was already his plan. You're not asking permission. You've, you've sought the mind of God First, hey, this is applicable from a church. It's applicable from your family. It's applicable for your own life. Pray for the plan. And then walk in the plan. Are you with me? Therefore, I say to you, 
Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. You've got, when you pray for the plan, church, you've got to believe God for the plan. God can give you his will. In fact, he has given us his will. He wrote it down. He's given us his plan. He wrote it down. When you pray for his plan, you have to believe him. See, God having a plan does not, does not cause things to carry out. Now, hold on a minute. Ultimately, God has a, has a timeline, a plan for humanity. He wrote it down in Daniel, Ezekiel, Revelation. There, there is a grand scheme that is going to play out. He, there's an appointed time that, that, he, that there's going to be a rapture of the church. That's going to happen. And there, uh, I've, talked about, I've heard people say this election or that election, that they bought the United States or the world more time. And my, No, we didn't. No, we haven't. God hadn't moved his timeline one iota, one millisecond because of who gets elected or doesn't get elected, etc., etc. That's just stupid. I didn't mean to say it that way, but that's how it came out. And it is. God's, God's prophetic timeline is going to play out to the, to the nth degree. But in our lives, God has a plan for us that we have a role in how it plays out. That we can walk in the plan of God or we cannot walk in the plan of God. I, I found a rabbit trail and I'm trying to decide to run it for a minute or not. Yeah, we have a choice in the matter. That people had today, they, well, and it's a trade, it, it comes into the church. Well, it was just meant to be. So and so, it can be somebody dying tragically. It can be some, it can be good, it can be bad. Well, it was just meant to be. Somebody cue the music. Okay, Sarah, Sarah. Whatever will be, will be. What are we doing here? If that's the case. We have a role to play. When you're praying. When it gives you the plan, believe the plan. He, he, he puts some interesting things in right here. When I read these things, it makes me feel a little better because Jesus throws things together that at first reading doesn't make sense together. And I do that too, so it makes me feel good. <laughs> and when you stand praying, not if, when, and when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. My, don't you wish he hadn't said that? I'm not out of words. I'm letting you think about that. Don't you wish you hadn't said it? Now listen, if you're anything like me, when you're mad about something and, you're, and, you, and somebody's got you bent out of shape whenever, whenever, they, whenever they've offended you and you've allowed it, sometimes you just want to savor it a while. Hello? Hello? Oh, now, preacher. Oh, now, please. You know, sometimes you've been all bent out of shape and you enjoy your bent out of shapeness. 
You know you're going to forgive them, but you're going to forgive them when you get good and ready. You know it's true. You can tell me later. <laughs> Jesus is talking about how you move mountains. How you move mountains don't make sense to me. I said don't. I should have said does it. I'm trying to break that habit. It doesn't make sense. Does not. Doesn't make sense to me. When you pray, believe. Ask and don't doubt. If you got a problem with somebody, get over it. That was the JRV. And if you are praying, verse 25, if you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against someone so that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive your sins. Oh my goodness. God just put a condition on my forgiveness. Did you see it? He said, when you stand praying, if you got something against someone, forgive them so that your Father who is in heaven can forgive you. God puts the power of your own forgiveness under your control. Oh, you mean it's not all predestined No choice. Whatever's going to be will be. You're in, you're out. Y'all don't know, but that's a, that's a, there's just forms of it everywhere. You say, well, preacher, we don't believe that. Well, we kind of let these things slip in. Jesus said, if you want to be forgiven, you have to, if you want your father to forgive, the formula is you forgive. Right? I think it's Matthew's gospel says if you can't forgive your if you can't forgive your father can't forgive you. Can't. Think that falls under that to whom much is given. Much shall be required. I laid out a lot this morning. Woo! A mountain. Now we got to stand and pray and ask and believe. And in the standing, the praying, the asking and believing, the do not doubt, the to speak to the mountain. Now we got to get over some stuff. See, it's not a matter, it's not a matter of if it's God's will. Whether it be the things we laid out this morning or the things God has spoke to you in your life. It is not a matter if those things are God's will for your life. It is a matter as if you're going to ask Him, if you're going to believe Him, if you're not going to doubt it. And if you're going to forgive people so that He can work in your life. Because our unforgiveness and our, and our grudges and our things that we let stand between us and Him block the will of God in our life. If you want your mountains moved, you got to get some things out of your way. Jesus saw the fig tree was hungry, perhaps. He said he saw the leaves and says, perhaps there will be some fruit. See, when the fig trees in that land were, were in season, when they were bearing fruit, they were bearing fruit in the time of leaves. Everything about it said that this was a fruitful tree. What I'm what he, why the curse? Because it's really simple. 
Jesus expects fruit. And, and if it's fruitless, it's useless. He expects fruit in our lives. He expects fruit in this church. People can see a church from the distance and say that's a property that is supposed to bear fruit. It looks good, but, does, but they're starving and they're hungry. Perhaps I'll find something there. It's got to be more than looking fruitful where you're expected to bear fruit. Fruitfulness is a key to the miraculous. When they asked Jesus what the curse was about, why curse the fig tree, he said, have faith in God. Fruitfulness is the key to moving mountains. The church needs to hear it from every pulpit thundered across the land that God expects fruit from His people. When you bear the fruit of the Spirit, forgiveness will be automatic in your life because the fruit of the Spirit is love. Don't block the plans of God by being fruitless. He said when you pray, you can say, when you do this, you can say to the mountains, be removed. In Zechariah chapter 4, they're at a time where, the, where the Israel, well, Israel has been, the children of Israel have been in captivity for decades. And they've been brought back in. And, the, and they have began to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and they have began to rebuild the temple. And it looked like an insurmountable obstacle, an insurmountable mountain. It looked impossible that after all the time of bondage that they could come back and have a fruitful city again and have a, and have a place to worship. And God begins to speak through the prophet and to the man Zerubbabel. And he said, they were saying, how in the world is this going to happen? Do you ever look at things and think, how in the world is this going to happen? Did you listen to your pastor this morning and think, how in the world is these things going to happen? Well, first of all, let's go back. If you, that we're going to have faith in God if you ask anything. <laughs> And you do leave it and don't doubt that you will have it, that the mountains have to move. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar. He said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. It used to be on the Pentecostal evangel when we had one of those. And it used to be one of the foundational scriptures of the Assemblies of God. But we got it all figured out now and we don't need this. He said, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. He said, listen, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts, what's that mean? The Lord, the God of the armies of heaven. Amen. The one that commands the legions of angels. The one that speaks the word and they act on his behalf.
Remember one time that they, when the children of Israel were facing certain death, certain slaughter, and they didn't know what to do, that, 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 there, was a, that, that they, there was no way their armies could defeat the enemy's armies. But it says that they prayed, and when they went to sleep that night, that God sent an angel into the camp of the enemy, and he, and he, and he slaughtered 180,000, I believe was the number, in their sleep, they never woke up. Why? Because he's the, he's, the, he's the Lord of hosts. The powers of this, of this creation move at his word. Another time, Jehoshaphat was facing sudden destruction. What do I do? God says, just hold your peace. We sing about that. If you hold your peace, let the Lord fight your battles. He said, Jehoshaphat, find the minstrels, find the musicians, find the singers, and send them out before your army. And let them begin to praise and to thank the God of heaven ahead of the battle. And with the sound of of the singing and the praise that the armies were confused and turned on each other and killed each other. And God's people never had to lift a hand. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, that it's not by might, that it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. He's, well, he is literally telling, and you, when you break down the words, he is saying, it's not by anything that you're going to work out, figure out, finance, or pay for. It's not by might. It's not by power. You're not going to be able to call and pull this string and pull that string and talk to that influencer and that politician and that, and that guy that gets things done from you. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And I, wow, what a question. I preached it last Sunday morning. This is a question that the prophet begins to speak to the problem. He said, who are you? O oh, great mountain, to stand before Zerubbabel. He was literally speaking to the problem and saying, listen to me. Who do you think you are? He said, before you, this mountain shall become a plain. How? When you cry, grace, grace unto it. Hmm. The things we've been talking about today, the vision that I believe with, all, see, I want, to, I want you, you to look at me real quick and understand something. The things I've laid out this morning, I'm not praying about. I'm not asking God's permission for I have prayed until God gave the plan and I've slept on the plan, prayed over the plan and thought about the plan, got nervous about the plan, wondered about the plan. How in the world can this be the plan? It's a mountain. But he said, have faith in God. And he said, if you'll ask and not doubt when you pray that you will have what you've asked for. When, when he gives you the plan, he said, who are you, great mountain, to stand? You have to come down. Not by might, nor by power. Not by, how are we going to do it, Pastor? I don't know. Who's going to pay for it? I don't know. How are we going to get the strings pulled? I don't know. I don't care. 
I don't have to figure it out. I can count on the Lord of heaven's armies that when I stand and look at the mountain that I can cry, grace, grace unto it. What is that? Grace, remember, is God doing for me, in me, through me what I can't do for myself. When God, when it's God's plan and you believe His plan, you don't need influence, you don't need money, you need faith. And to stand and believe. By the way, According to Jesus, you're going to have to get over some stuff. Because unforgiveness and grudges will stand in the way of removing the mountain. I ain't going to tell you about it because it's none of your business. But I will tell you this, I was in Africa looking at a situation that somebody else done. It was a good thing. It was a great work. And I realized that I was harboring some things in my heart. That I felt like I had the right to hold on to. Even though I preach against that. Every one of us have been guilty in this room when it comes right down to it of holding on to things that no matter what the Word says, no matter what the preacher says, no matter how many times the, the Spirit of God has dealt with it with you slightly, just giving you the opportunity to take care of it, sometimes He'll hit you in the face with you think you have the right to that offense and to that hurt and to that grudge. And you don't. We do not have the right to hold on to that garbage. It is standing between what God can do for me and what God can do for you. If you want to think you have the right to hold on to it, go ahead, but it's blocking your prayer. Jesus said so. He said, when you stand and pray, if you have something against them, forgive them so that God can forgive you. Why do I need forgiveness? Because he said my sin stands between me and him. He's under no obligation to work on my behalf. See, we've been through so we've been through decades of teaching that says that God is at our beck and call. <laughs> Let y'all we all laugh that we've all listened to them nuts. They'll say, if you do this, then God's word, and God has to. <laughs> Purge yourself of that junk. It's God's grace that he ever does anything for me. He don't have to do anything for me. He doesn't owe me a thing. I don't command God around. I obey his command. I don't order him around. I don't send him on assignment for me. He gives me his word. I humble myself under the mighty hand of God. And I cry grace that is undeserved. I, if we would think about how we're saved. If we would think about how he works. We would know that it's by grace. And that I don't deserve it. God owes me nothing. What abominable doctrine that's taken over the Pentecostal church world for 50 years. That God owes you something. And if you come up with the right formula, he has to jump for you. Ichabod. And we wonder why we find ourselves where we're at in America. Because we've taught that the gospel is about us. It's about what we can get. Instead of what we can give. See the fruit. The fig tree had nothing to give. It had nothing to offer. It said I look good. But I am fruitless. And Jesus. Cursed it. And the disciples. Saw it.
And we've read it tonight, and now we've saw it. And it says they asked Jesus, and they heard him. He has much to do here. He has much to do corporately in your family and in your life. And he wants to move and he wants to work. And he wants us to realize that, that we ain't so cool that God is jumping around for us. That we're not calling in favors. And I, I see people that... Sometimes I just hate what people do in the name of Jesus. Do you know how many times people have had it all figured out in the plans, in the works, and they present it like God done a miracle, and they just had, they, God didn't do a miracle. You qualified for a loan. <laughs> Woo, look what God built. No, they didn't. First National did. Are y'all hearing that? And everybody shouts. When God didn't do anything, you just, you just went through a natural process and made it happen, and God wasn't even there. I'm talking about things that if God's not there, first financial can't help us with. I'm talking about things that if God don't go through, that Congressman Babin can't do a thing for us. Or Sheriff Mooney can't do a thing for us. Or that the general superintendent or the district superintendent or whoever can't do a thing for us. If we haven't heard from God, we haven't prayed, we have quit doubting, we have forgiven, and we stand and believe until the mountain moves. He says it's before you that the mountain becomes a plain when you cry grace, grace unto it. We got to have the Lord of Heaven's armies to move the unmovable that goes ahead and changes minds when they don't even know why. Yeah? I remember one time, no, it was the other day, you ever, you ever, you ever, I think nearly everybody in this room except this front row or so has came to this point probably. Just here a while back, when reality it was 25 years ago. <laughs> Some of you, if you ain't there, you'll get there and you'll know what I'm talking about. But I remember when I was going to church at Van Buren and God was moving. Whew. It was God moving. Downtown Fort Smith, which is just across the river, just Arkansas River runs between the two cities, that's it. And downtown Fort Smith was just a cesspool of, well, part of it's because it's so close to Oklahoma, but that's another story. <laughs> There's just a river between Fort Smith and Oklahoma, too. But just all there is is gambling and casinos across the line trash hole adult stores, strip clubs. That's what's bordered up Oklahoma to Fort Smith, just the Arkansas River between downtown, falling apart, nothing but bars and cheap motels and everything that comes with it, drugs and prostitutes. Trouble. Brother Johnson began to feel that Van Buren needed to plant a church down in the middle of all that. I remember it well. What do you want to do that for? Well, do those people not need Jesus, he said? He said, I don't know. It's not my dream. He said, I was just praying, and this is where I'm at. There was an old family dollar or dollar general down there right in the middle of it. Perfect location. He called them. They wanted something like $1.2 million for it in the middle of just... I want to keep picking on Oklahoma, but I better not. He called me, he, he'd say, 
I believe that piece of property is mine. He said, I'll, I'll give you 500000 for it. He said, nope, one million, that's it. He said, okay, I'll give you 300000 for it. <laughs> that's how he negotiated. They called one day, they said, 700000 He said, one fifty. Because what he knew is that they were coming down a quarter million dollars at a time. Nobody wanted their piece of property. Not by might, nor by power. They could have qualified for any amount of money they had wanted. They ran 2,500 people at the time. The bank would have gave them anything they wanted. You hearing me? He could have just called and said, I want that building downtown. They say, write the check. It'll be good when it get, comes in, kind of thing. 300,000, 100. One day the man called, it was his representative, and he said, Brother Johnson's secretary said, Brother Johnson, so-and-so's on the line, he needs to talk to you right away. He said, put him through. Answered the phone, he said, Preacher! He said, you got $75,000? He said, I do. He said, would you please buy this building for $75,000? Because if I don't sell it to you, I'm going to have to give it to you. <laughs> and he did. And they did. And they planted that church. And for decades, there was hundreds and thousands of people in that armpit of Fort Smith, Arkansas, that heard the gospel. They packed it out Friday and Saturday night, Friday and Saturday night, Friday and Saturday night, week after week, month after month, year after year, until today. It's kind of nice downtown now. It's revitalized. You say, did the church do that? You better believe a church did that. You better believe when the light comes into a place that it changes everything. You better believe. And what am I telling you? I'm telling you that that that, that bank loans and political influence isn't what we need. We need grace. 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 That moves mountains. That's what we need. I love the question. Do you realize that's what he's saying? Who are you? Great mountain that you would stand before God. He said, you will become flat. When, how? He goes on to say, Zerubbabel, he said, you will. You're the one, he said, you're the one that started it. You will see it finished. He said, you will lay the capstone on this temple. Not the foundational stone. You're not just going to start it. You are going to lay the capstone on this thing. When you cry grace. Grace into it. What was he saying? That what I've had you start. I have plenty of power and ability to finish. If you'll walk with me. If you'll believe me. If you'll know that you're walking. That your power comes from walking in the grace of God. Stand with me all across this place.